you have a copy of God's Word with you, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to find your place in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, and this morning we're going to look at Mark 6, 53 through 56, as I continue my series of messages entitled Miraculous. And we're looking at the miracles of Jesus and learning what these miracles teach us about our walk, our life with Christ. As you're finding your place in your Bibles, did you hear in the parking lot this morning, we had a literal dumpster fire, (laughs) a literal dumpster fire. And I know what many of you are wondering after the boat last week, is this some type of sermon object lesson? Like my life is a dumpster fire apart from Christ? No, that's not what happened. Church work never disappoints, does it? All right. It's always something. All right. Hey, a couple of important things. Remember, we have a reception for the Garner family. And Galen and Tiffany are in here this morning. We're so grateful for them. And you'll hear from Galen before the end of our service. Remember also, uh, leading up to Christmas, we want to be salt and light. We want to be faithful to Jesus' commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And so we, on Saturday mornings, uh, starting this coming Saturday, are going to try to give out Christmas invites to houses in the neighborhood around our church. And we have somewhere in here inside my pulpit, we got a lot of stuff in here this morning, just wait, all right? We have these invites. These are available uh, throughout the church at our key entry points, and you can use these starting now to invite people this Christmas season. These have our Christmas events on the front and a gospel invitation on the back. And so be faithful to invite. Many people during this season are open to an invite to church and open to hearing about the things of Christ. So we have a goal of personally handing out a thousand of these. And then Saturday mornings we'll begin meeting At 10.15, dispatch by 10.30, be back by 11.30. We want to be faithful to the neighborhoods around our church to invite people this Christmas season. So be a part of that. We also have a devotional book that you can use during the Christmas season to minister to people. We're making these available at cost, giving a Bible reading plan, an invite, a gospel track, a Christmas card, nicely wrapped here, and you can use these. I'm gonna buy several and give them out to neighbors and people and businesses that I've invited to church before. That's another opportunity this Christmas season to be salt and light for Jesus. Hey, remember Sunday nights, Uh, We have our third person study looking at the person and work of Jesus Christ. We'll meet tonight, 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. We're talking about the work of sanctification. And if you're not able to join us in person, you can listen on Spotify, follow along on YouTube or a TBC app. Hey, really important announcement before we jump into the text. For several weeks, several months, your worship pastor search committee has been searching for our next worship pastor. And I'm excited to announce that they believe God has led them to the man who will serve as our next worship pastor here at Tabernacle. So we're thankful for that. One thing that was really important for me in all of this is that we know who we are as a church. There's a lot of good churches in our community, churches who have a different approach to worship. Tabernacle is really unique with who we are. Do you know that? We, not many churches nowadays have a choir with the participation that we have, an orchestra like we have. One thing we want to be is just to be true to who we are. The Lord will use all different types of churches to reach all different types of people. It's just my conviction. One of the worst things we could do is try to be something or someone we're not. The Lord wants to use who we are. So with that in mind, As we search for our next worship pastor, we search for an individual who would have skills in leading a a large choir and skills in leading an orchestra. One thing that was really important for us was someone with pastoral experience. The man we'll be calling has over 20 years of pastoral experience and leading in a local church. That was really important to us. Uh, This individual as well, we believe is a good fit for our culture and He's a good fit for the chemistry of our staff team here at Tabernacle Baptist. We're impressed with his godly character, his love for the Lord, his love for the church, his commitment to the truth of God. And so with that being said, I'm announcing today, November 10th, I'll announce this again next week, November 17th, 
Uh, For the care and concern of our sister church, we will not disclose his name until November 23rd. We will vote November 24th. We invite you to be here for a reception. Drop in at any time between 1 to 4 p.m. on November 3rd, and you can meet our candidate. He will be here in person helping Larry lead worship on November 24th. And as Baptists, we believe in congregational affirmation. We will have a time as a church body to affirm the recommendation of this search committee. So let's just thank the Lord again for his goodness and his leadership. And I'm excited about what the Lord has in store for us. All right? If you have a copy of God's Word, and if you are physically able, I'm going to invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's Holy Word. I'm continuing my series, Miraculous. We want to know about Jesus by examining his miracles, and I'm speaking this morning on the subject, spiritual checkup. The Bible says when they, speaking of Jesus and his disciples, had crossed over, that's the Sea of Galilee, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. That means they anchored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And they ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Father, thank you for the opportunity to know you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you that we are a part of your body and this spiritual church called Tabernacle. And now we look into your word And we say during this time of worship, we need bread from heaven. Lord, we need you to fill our souls. We need you to set our minds and our hearts aright. Lord, we've, in one sense, steeped in the things of the world all week long, and now we need to steep and soak and saturate in the things of the Lord. Holy Spirit of the living God, as I open your word and explain it, would you encourage, edify, Build up your people for the glory of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Spiritual checkup. Perhaps you know what it's like to have a physical checkup, to visit a doctor. Maybe you've got a condition or an ailment that requires you to go to the doctor every once in a while. Maybe you're in that age range that we lovingly and carefully call classic adults, and you have to regularly have some sort of checkup. I myself, I regularly have to get a checkup in relation to my allergies. The allergies have really bothered me since I've been back in Georgia. I know y'all don't want to hear me whine about that, but I moved out to Oklahoma for five years and got declimatized from the glorious pollen in the south. And so regularly I check up with my ENT doctor and my regular care doctor, and they keep an eye on my allergies and my treatments. Here in the text we have before us today, I believe we could regard this passage as pointing to a disciple's need for a spiritual checkup. It is worthwhile every once in a while for believers, as Paul would say in one of his letters to the church at Corinth, to examine themselves, to see where they are, In the faith, the events of our text occurred immediately after one of Jesus' other great miracles. Jesus had walked on the water in front of his disciples. Now, with all of Jesus' miracles, there is Hebrews 2, 4, a sign and a wonder. I've been trying to remind us of this throughout this series on miracles, miracles performed by Jesus are classified in Bible language as signs and wonders. They're wonders and that they were intended to make people marvel and notice that Jesus was special. Jesus was more than a man. He was a God man. He was more than a teacher. He was a redeemer. He was more than a religious leader. He was the word who became flesh to pay for our sins. He was very creator God. 
So miracles served as a wonder. They were designed to get people's attention and notice that Jesus was otherworldly. But miracles were also a sign, Hebrews 2, 4. This means every miracle has built-in object lessons within it. Truth about life and discipleship, the Christian life, that disciples need to learn. Now, the disciples had just experienced great fear and great failure as they attempted to row across the Sea of Galilee in their own strength, and Jesus appeared to them, walking on the water, revealing that Genesis 1-2, he is God. After this incident, Jesus and his disciples, verse 53, crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and they came to the land at Gennesaret. And it was here that Jesus would perform more miracles, and in doing so, provide a sign of his disciples' need for spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And now we have this passage and all of these events recorded for us to remind us of our need for spiritual growth, our need of spiritual health, our need for spiritual discernment and maturity. I want us to perform this morning what we could call a spiritual checkup. It is good for you to take inventory of your life spiritually. It is good for us to regularly stand before the mirror of God's word and examine where we are in our relationship with the Lord. The world outside these walls has a way of deceiving us, duping us, and discouraging us. We all in life face trials and temptations and testing. We need strength and security through Jesus Christ if we want to thrive and survive in this life. If we want to be all that the Lord wants us to be, and if we're going to be used in this society as change agents for Jesus, it's important for us to perform a spiritual checkup. Now, here's what I want us to do this morning. I want to offer three questions that can be used for a spiritual checkup. Three questions drawn from this text before us that can help us examine our spiritual health before King Jesus. First question is this. Am I, let's make it real personal, am I producing spiritual fruit? Am I producing spiritual fruit? Did you know that this metaphor of fruit is used over and over again in Scripture to speak of what Jesus desires your life to be? In Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 7, after Jesus had given the Sermon on the Mount, or as he drew the Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion, Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit, and bad trees bear bad fruit. And bad trees are cut down and thrown into the fire. So Jesus made it clear, disciples are to bear spiritual fruit. Now we'll talk about what such fruit is in a moment, but I want you to see the reference to fruitfulness in this passage. We believe the disciples in verse number 49 through 51 were not exhibiting spiritual fruit because they were gripped by man-centered fear. Jesus walked on the water, and verse 53 says, they crossed over the sea, and they came to the land at Gennesaret. Gennesaret. I have a hard time pronouncing that word. I had someone recently after a sermon tell me, Pastor, you need some help pronouncing Bible names. You should download this app. It's called Bible Pronunciation. And you just open the app. People tell me all types of things after hearing me preach. You <laughs> open the app and type in a name, and it will appear, and you press on it, and it will pronounce the name. Gennesaret. 
Everybody say Gennesaret. Say Gennesaret three times really fast. That's difficult. What is this place, Gennesaret? They anchored there. They moored to the shore. Well, this was a little fertile plain just south of Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus' ministry. The disciples had left the region of Capernaum and had attempted to travel to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. But a sovereign storm blew their ship off course. Jesus had a plan in all of this. He knew his disciples needed to learn a lesson about trusting him and bearing spiritual fruit. They needed to learn a lesson about who he was, who he is. He appeared to them walking on the water, and after the storm, they turned their boat around, went in the opposite direction, and the Lord Jesus led them to land at Gennesaret, a fertile, fruitful plain on the northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee. As they approached the seashore, this plain would have been about a mile in width taking up the seashore of the Sea of Galilee. It was about three miles in depth. And in the first century world, this fertile plain, this fruitful land known as Gennesaret, was famous for its production of walnuts, palm, olives, and figs. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't had many figs lately. I haven't eaten much heart of palm. I've had some walnuts here and there. These things weren't staples, aren't staples in our modern diet, but in the first century world, these things made up the regular diet of people in the ancient Near East. From this location, all of this fruit was shipped to various parts of the known world. Galileans made their living apart from fish off of this fruit. And it is here that Jesus took his fearful and fruitless and faithless, to a degree, disciples. Why do the Gennesaret, after the incident on the raging sea, perhaps Jesus wanted to take his disciples to this lush location in order to remind them of their need to bear spiritual fruit? It's as if Jesus is bringing the 12 back to their senses and reminding them of their need to be fruitful as disciples. There's a lesson here for us. In all generations, it is imperative for God's people to keep a close watch on their lives and to look for and to seek after spiritual produce and fruit for the glory of Jesus. The Lord was, didn't save you for you just to continue to be how you are. He wants to take your life and as a trophy of grace, he wants you to be like a luscious valley, a beautiful tree that bears all types of fruit upon which others can feed. He wants your life to be a tree of life that imparts grace in a world of death. Recently, I got to studying fruit. I like to eat fruit. I love fruit. Can we get an amen for fruit this morning? Fruit is good. I call fruit God's candy. I try to avoid all the man-made candy that's out there because there's a lot of sweetness in fruit if you lay off the sugar and all the man-made treats. Now I'm stepping on toes. I know it, right? But I got, I got to research in fruit. Did you know there's actually a group that has ranked the top fruits in America? Just as we rank college football teams, people rank fruit. Any guesses on what the number one fruit is? Pineapple. Bananas. Pineapple. What? <laughs> I've been watching too much SpongeBob. All right. Okay. Never mind. Um, <laughs> banana, number one. Y'all are a little bit smarter than the first crowd. All right, so bananas, number one. Any guess on number two? I was surprised on number two. Not apples. Strawberries. Oh, huh. Mm. Those are really good. 
Number three. Yeah, and you knew Apple was going to come along before long. All right, there's Apple's number three. Any guess on number four? Grapes. I heard grapes. There's somebody like pomegranate. <laughs> Not pomegranate. We have grapes. All right. So there are your top four fruits according to the World Wide Web. Bananas, strawberries, apples, and grapes. Did you know there's four fruits that Jesus wants to appear in your life? Jesus uses this metaphor, the word of God uses this metaphor over and over again. When Jesus saves you, he saves you, yes, so that you'll go to heaven when you die, but Jesus saves you so that your life will be transformed and so that his image will be reflected to a world that is so in need of the grace of God. When we think of the spiritual fruit the Lord wants in our lives, we can first think of spiritual growth. In Galatians 5, through 23, we read of spiritual growth. We have a slide, if we could put that on the screen, please. Thank you. Spiritual growth, we read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do you know what the Lord wants to do in your life when you are saved? He wants your desires to be changed, your thought process to be changed, and thereby he wants how you talk and how you live to be changed so that your life might reflect the life of Christ in a world that so greatly needs a witness for Jesus. Spiritual growth. We can think on top of spiritual growth of the need for soul winning. By this, we mean this act of witnessing to others, sharing the gospel with others, so that others are transformed by the message of Christ. The Bible uses this imagery of fruit to speak of soul winning. In Proverbs 11.30, we read, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Why this Christmas season are we seeking to canvas a thousand doors around our neighborhood? Why are we having a float in the Christmas parade and handing out invites and gospel tracts? Why am I as a pastor encouraging us to personally invite people over the Christmas season and share the gospel? Because Jesus wants our lives to be fruitful in this area of soul winning. Jesus took his disciples to the luscious plain of Gennesaret, likely to remind them of their need for spiritual fruitness over the fear that was gripping their lives. And soul winning is one form of spiritual fruit that should appear in our lives. We can also think of the fruit of service. When Paul spoke about his service for Christ, he said, if I am to live in the flesh, that means in a human body, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul knew that as a believer, he was called to use his time and his talents, his skills and abilities to some measure within the church and within the kingdom of Christ, serving and meeting needs so that the body of Christ might be built up and blessed. Jesus calls us to have spiritual fruit in our lives. I ask you this morning, Are you serving the kingdom of Christ in any way? Perhaps you're teaching. Perhaps you're helping with the ministry. Like our bridge ministry on Wednesday night that has so many different outreach projects. Maybe you help with our bread of life ministry. Maybe you regularly go on short-term mission trips. Maybe you serve in our kids' ministry or serve in our worship ministry. This is a serving church. I'm thankful for so many servants, but I I hold up a reminder that Jesus wants the fruit of service in our lives. We can lastly think about our need for faithful stewardship. This is another sort of fruit. I'm always amazed when people say things like this to me. Uh, Patrick, the Bible never talks about money. The Bible never talks about giving. Preachers shouldn't talk about that, or churches shouldn't talk about that. Sometimes as a pastor, there's things going through your mind that you know you shouldn't say and you kind of bite your tongue. Sometimes I want to say, tell me you've never read the Bible without telling me you've never read the Bible. (laughs) 
Bible is replete. Jesus' teaching was full of admonitions concerning us being faithful with all of our financial resources. The Bible regularly urges us to be faithful, to give for the sake of missions and ministry. And Paul, in speaking about the stewardship of the Philippians, who were poor, by the way, he said this, not that I seek the gift in your giving, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. As the Philippians faithfully gave to Paul's mission ministry, Paul knew that this was like spiritual fruit in their lives. I've given you a grocery list of spiritual fruit this morning. And I've done so for the purpose of a spiritual checkup. Is there any fruit in your life? Are you producing fruit? Is there spiritual growth? Have you been gaining victory over old toxic emotions? Has your speech patterns become more holy and more Christ honoring as you walk with Christ? Are you learning obedience over besetting sins? Do others see Jesus through your life? How about the fruit of soul winning? Have you invited anyone to worship recently? Have you used any relationship to share the gospel? Are you ever around people who don't know Christ and as you're around them, do you ever try to speak the name of Jesus and to encourage them in a spiritual sense? If you're really following Christ, these are fruits that should appear in your life. What about service? Are you a Sunday morning spectator without serving in some way during the week in the body of Christ? What about stewardship? In a world as wealthy as the United States, perhaps the wealthiest nation ever to grace the face of earth, are you in this blessed nation taking any of your resources and contributing to the work of gospel missions and ministry? This is a spiritual fruit that should be appearing in disciples' lives. And we should stand before the word of God this morning and examine ourselves. Spiritual checkup. Perhaps this morning some need to pray and say, Oh Lord, I've been so deficient in that area. Forgive me and help me. Perhaps some need to give praise. Lord, thank you for your grace and how I've grown in that area. And Perhaps we all could pray. Lord, make me more and more fruitful so this dark so that this dark world might see the light of Christ through me so question number 1 is am i producing fruit question number 2 is this am i focusing on Jesus look at verse number 54 the bible says when they got out of the boat the people immediately recognized him. Have you ever seen a famous person in person? I can remember being on the streets of Atlanta one time and we were driving down, I believe it was 14th Street or 15th Street, trying to get to I-75, and I saw on the sidewalk Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal. That's Shaquille O'Neal! You could see people on the street pointing and recognizing these guys. NBA players, in case you don't know. It's not just Papa John's, all right? He's like a basketball player. Now, now note, Jesus appears, and people had likely seen him teach before, seen him perform miracles. We'd seen earlier in Mark's gospel that people had flocked to hear him on other occasions, and so as they land on the seashore of the Sea of Galilee, immediately people recognize him. News begins to spread, rumors begin to spread like a wildfire and people are rushing to see Jesus and to meet him. Now it seems like Mark in the literature of the New Testament is doing something intentional here. He says the people immediately recognized him. These are common people, these are villagers, these aren't Jesus' closest disciples. 
Perhaps they had only met Jesus or seen Jesus on one occasion before, but they immediately recognized Jesus. Now, Mark, in the literature of the New Testament, it seems that he is doing something very strategic. If y'all remember from last week, I had a boat on the stage. You remember that? It's kind of out of the ordinary, right? Had a boat on the stage. You remember Jesus, right before this event, had walked on the water in front of his disciples. What happened when Jesus walked on the water? Did the disciples immediately say, oh, look, it's Jesus? No. Verse 49, when they saw him, look in your Bible, when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. If you look back at Mark 6, 33, before Jesus fed the 5,000, Jesus had appeared there in another fertile plain, and it says, and they went away in the boat to a desert place by themselves, verse 32, and many saw them going and recognized them. There's like a sandwich in Mark's writing. In verse 33 of chapter 6, the crowds recognized Jesus. In verse 54 of Mark chapter 6, the crowds recognized Jesus. But right in between the crowds on two different occasions recognizing Jesus, you have the disciples who don't recognize Jesus. They think he's a ghost. The language doesn't even use he, it's an impersonal it. They were blinded to the realities of who Jesus really was. They were so focused on their fear that they had lost sight of Christ. Isn't this like us as disciples at times? Our eyes get so filled up with the things of the world that Jesus is often an afterthought in our daily schedule. We hear the voices of society on our favorite news channel and we begin to rationalize and reason. We begin to give in to fear and worry with little thought of Jesus and we allow a newscaster to program our thinking. We scan social media and we look at what friends say and acquaintances say. We look at how they live. We suck in the spirit of the world And Jesus becomes a fuzzy it to us. We listen to our own fears and worries. We listen sometimes to our own insecurities and our dread. And we forget that Jesus has said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The disciples Here stand as a reminder for us. This crowd instructs us. We need to always be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to be regularly setting our eyes, Colossians 3, 1 through 2, on the things above, not on the things below. We need to be on guard that Jesus is the most important reality in our life. We need to examine ourselves. Do we know what it's like to really have a relationship with him through prayer? Do we know what it's like to open up the word of God or a good devotional book and experience Jesus speaking to us? I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm talking about that Elijah, that 1 Kings 19, still small voice where the Lord uses his word to really just minister to your heart and life. Do you know these things? Do you know Jesus Or is he just like a, as the French would say, an a la carte item in your life, an add-on? Oh, how do you get focused on Jesus? Well, you need a daily time with him. Jesus is the word, and he has revealed himself through the word of God, the Bible. Be careful you don't have a TikTok or Instagram or social media spirituality where your mind and your relationship with God is marked by all the opinions of humanity on the internet. Make sure you have a real spiritual Christian walk that comes from the meat and potatoes of God's word. And then learn the secret of true prayer. Jesus said that men ought to always pray and not give up, Luke 18, 1. And prayer is a way 
of us directing our hearts and souls to Jesus. Learn the secret of Matthew 6, 6, scheduled prayer. Learn the secret of 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, spontaneous prayer. And Jesus will become bigger in your life, so to speak. And you will be protected from the sad spiritual state of the disciples who couldn't recognize Jesus when he was right in front of them, revealing himself as God and walking on the water. Spiritual checkup. Am I producing fruit? Am I focusing on Jesus? And number three, and lastly, I would ask this. Am I saved? Do I really know God? Have my sins been forgiven through Jesus Christ? Have I been given a new heart by the Holy Spirit? Do I know for certain that I know Christ? Have I taken my sins to Calvary and asked him for forgiveness? Am I confident that to be absent from the body, if I was to die, would be to be present with the Lord? Patrick, where do you see salvation in this text? Well, follow along again, starting in verse number 55. The Bible says people ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Some Bible scholars have put things together with the text here, and they've said on some occasions in Mark's gospel that people ran a distance equivalent to a modern fun run, a 5K distance, 3.1 miles, wanting to see Jesus. They implored him, verse 56 says, they implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, This means they had heard about the healing incidents back in chapter 5 where a woman with an issue of blood touched Jesus' garment. They implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And listen to this. And as many as touched it were made well. Am I saved? Where do you see salvation here, Patrick? Interestingly, the Greek word translated made well is sozo. Now, you don't need to remember that word, and the only reason I share that word with you is to say this. That word is the word that is often used in the New Testament to speak of Christian spiritual salvation. What is Mark doing here? Well, remember, he's writing years after these events. Peter, as an apostle, is a source for Mark, telling him how things went down. By this time, the church was growing and developing, and by this time, the church had already developed a common word for Christian salvation. And it was the very word Mark chose to use right here. What was Mark doing? It seems he wanted to point to Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. The prophet Isaiah and his writings had told of the way in which when Messiah came to earth, he would physically heal people as a sign of the spiritual healing he would provide. In sharing of the way Jesus made people well, Mark undoubtedly wanted to point people to their ultimate need in life, and that is spiritual healing. When we have people in our church who are physically sick, we pray for them that they would be made well. Sometimes we see people and they recover and we give glory and praise to God and we say, it seems the Lord. We can't see behind the veil. We don't know all things, but it seems like the Lord perhaps brought healing. At times, however, we pray for healing and we pray for health. And it seems from a human perspective that our prayers aren't answered and the sick perish and die. And we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope because we know ultimately our physical bodies are going to fail at some point. And we know ultimately that there is something worse than physical death. And that is spiritual death. 
We know that the healing that people need most of all is not something for their physical bodies. Oh, we seek that when we can get it. But that's not the healing we need most of all. There is eternity coming. A righteous, holy God is going to make all things new. He is going to remove every liar and all sin from the human equation, and he's going to return earth to his original intent. Garden of Eden, part two. And there will be no more sin. There will be no more corruption. There will be no more murder. There will be no more abuse. There will be no more human trafficking. There will be no more wars. It'll be peace in God's paradise forever. And righteous King Jesus will rule upon the earth. And I'll be there to say, I told you so. (laughs) How can we be a part of that new kingdom? Spiritual healing. This word sozo was used. The salvation that Jesus brings in Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. Why did Jesus come to earth? Because you're an imperfect human marked by sin and you need spiritual healing. Jesus will save you. Look to the God man who died for your sins, paying the penalty you deserve. Call out to him and he will spiritually heal you and save you. Paul used this same word sozo in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 5, and saying, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that's what we deserve because of our sin, spiritual death, we were made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been sozo, saved. And Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be sozo, saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is sozo, saved. Spiritual checkup, church. Are you bearing spiritual fruit? Is Christ changing you and growing you and developing you? Are you focusing on Jesus? Are you being distracted and duped and deceived by the world? And lastly, I ask, are you saved?